history. Notice we have just been gliding from theater to art and art history and continue. Uh, she is a, she calls it practices of uh, graphic design. She, uh, and she's from 2013 to 2015, uh, Danielle was a visiting artist fellow at Princeton University's Lewis Center for the Arts. Uh, congratulations on that, Danielle. And she's interested in the relationship of graphic design, labor, and politics. It's my great pleasure to introduce again Danielle Morgan. Typesetter or the typographer and the machines that they're printing off of. Um, 
Uh, so like more or less mobility depending on the particular stage. So the first stage is the longest stage of, of uh, movable type. Um, this is a uh, like Benjamin Franklin's print shop. Um, but so this is a long period beginning really in like with the invention of movable type in China, but then there's a big moment when Johannes or Gutenberg prints the Bible in Germany in 1450, and then basically from then until really uh, the early part of the 20th century, movable type is the dominant um, way that things are printing printed. Um, and so you know this is there's a print there there are the cases in the upper right hand corner. You can see the where they would where you would store metal type. So by necessity, you have to be pretty close to the printing press because the metal type would be assembled into blocks and then printed. So you couldn't, and these were really heavy. And this is also a time when um, a lot of there's a lot of women printers and even child laborers working in um, typesetting because small fingers were like <laughs> faster for getting all the little like the little tiny um, letters out of those cases. Uh, and on the political left, uh, there is also the emergence of the International Typographical Union in the mid-19th century as a um, powerful labor union. And you know, to me, it was just noteworthy that the, or it's interesting that it wasn't called, it wasn't called the Printers Union, but it was called the Typographical Union. Um, so it's also like interesting that, so the typesetters and printers would be working alongside one another, and oftentimes they would just be the same person. But also in this environment, you often um, you see you see a lot more printers authoring texts themselves, um, or working you know more closely with authors. So it's sort of noteworthy that Benjamin Franklin was also a printer. Uh, and then um, second sort of stage is this transitional stage, um, which emerges emerges with the prevalence of offset printing equipment, uh, sort of mid twentieth century kind of. Um, is when it became more commercially viable, and that kind of lasted through the 1980s or so, when typography was done using a combination of digital and analog methods. So, um, like offset presses use metal plates that get burned with an image, and that is printed. Uh, and so, the image is assembled using uh, type that could be generated on, uh, like, an IBM selector or Veritate machines, which is basically like a typewriter uh, or uh, rub off letters. And pages would be typed up and um, kind of pasted up onto sheets, and then those would be photographed, and then those um, and they'd get printed from there. And so this is a stage when you see like the emergence of a lot of underground presses, um, because and, and as far as the like mobility, you know, the, for the most part, you can have all of the equipment and materials in one site, but you start to see like a kind of a separation where. Uh, uh, for instance, in Detroit, at the at the at the print co-op, they had the um, uh, equipment to print and also to photograph sheets. But then you could make the paste up mechanical somewhere else. So there was the Fifth Estate, which was another kind of underground newspaper, which is still functioning now. Um, they had offices somewhere in like on the in the Cass Corridor, so people would like pay, do their paste up mechanicals and then take them across town to wherever to get printed or photographed. So you start to kind of see this like separation. Um, and this is when the Detroit uh, Printing Co-op, this is another this example, uh, this is when the printing co-op kind of flourished uh, through the 70s. And then now, like the stage we're in now, I would call it like the digital stage where it, which arose with the desktop computer. And so we typesetters and typographers are all using Adobe Creative Suite software. And you almost always have um, <clears throat> like a physical distance between the designer or the typesetter and the printer unless you're talking about a laser printer, but you have like, if you're doing any kind of um, mass production, it's usually some, it's at least across town, if not around the world somewhere in, you know, Asia um, or Europe, you know, but from here. So here you have like really increased potential for mobility, especially on the part of the typographer, but then there's really very little relationship between the designer and the printer, besides sometimes going on press checks, um, and the division of labor is like complete. So, um, there's, you know, the, the printers have their own software that they need to know in order to operate their massive presses. Um, so this is an example of, yeah, just my friend's studio, <laughs> or like her work scenario on the right, and then a print shop. This is actually done on Detroit uh, Inland Press. But you know, they're, they're kind of, yeah, there's just, it's like there's like huge machines and then there's people on little laptops. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit about talking about uh, Freddie Perlman, who, like I said, was kind of in, the, in you know working really in this transitional moment. Uh, 
and the Detroit Printing Co-op more generally. Um, so the thing about that time was that because people were shifting over, um, shifting methods with, with relation to print, printing, um, equipment was cheaper. Like so, so, so they were able to. Um, like there arose in Detroit, but also on the West Coast and in New York and Chicago, this underground presses. Um, and I became specifically interested in the work of the print co-op in Detroit and of Freddie Pullman in particular because of his experimental approach to printing, but also because he was an author, like he was a publisher, an author, and he also typeset documents and he also printed and operated the machines and he kind of played a lot with the printing. So this is just a random um, print of him that some you know photographs someone else took of him while he was in the print shop. Um, he was a founder of the publishing house Black and Red, and um, he had gotten a PhD in economics in, in Yugoslavia. So he came from the U.S. He went over to Yugoslavia in the '60s to Belgrade University to get an economics degree there. And then he was in France during the May 1968 general strike and uprising, and then moved to Michigan. Um, to teach for a year at Western Michigan, but then he like hated academia. He was there for one year and has only negative things to say about um, academics. And <laughs> he quit and moved to Detroit um, and set up the print call with a group of friends. So his writing has been really influential to um, like anarchist thought, um, specifically his book Against History, Against Leviathan. And He's not as well known as a printer, and he's really not thought of as a typographer or a designer, but that's kind of my like angle or how I kind of got into his work was when I saw some of what he had designed. Um, so in 1969, Perlman and friends learned of this um, anarchist press in Chicago that was closing down and looking to sell their 50-year-old offset press, and they raised money to buy it and then um, set up a, uh, moved it into a building near the corner of Michigan Avenue in Vinewood. And then over the next decade or so, they would print tens of thousands of copies of books, flyers, posters, community calendars, pamphlets um, at the press. Um, and then the sort of famous one that I mentioned was the Society of the Spectacle. And this is important in that it would travel widely in the world um, outside of Detroit. I was I didn't realize it was actually printed here. So the, the first um, and then the form that it takes that they gave to it actually would leave an a, a important mark on the way that te this text is received. Um, so the first edition has this image of it on the cover of office buildings. Um, but, and on the back is this photo of people wearing 3D glasses, which had appeared in Life magazine. And then later it comes onto the cover. And this image is really an iconic image that I think many people directly associate with the um, divorce society, the spectacle, and even with the situationists more generally. Um, and so the story of the production of the publication is also interesting because Freddie Perlman and a group of friends, uh, including his wife Lorraine Perlman, would meet together to do translations, kind of like group translations. Um, and then if you look down here, it says it's an unauthorized translation. Uh, and, and Guido Bohr later would claim to be unhappy about what he called these uh, pirate translations of his work. Um, but they also made this decision, this like important editorial decision to bring images into the work, which are not in the French copy. And he, they, they went to the main branch of the Detroit Public Library, they would go to the image collection room and borrow, um, check out images, I, which I, 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 I want to try, I, I don't really understand how it works, but I guess you can check out images. Um, I've seen there, they have just like pictures, like folders of pictures of cars and stuff in them, so they would take those and then photograph them and then interspersed them in the text where they thought it made, you know, made sense or, or didn't make sense. So a lot of the images, um, and then they made these collages, um, which then have shown up in films about the situationists. Um, and the, a lot of them are actually images of Detroit, um, if you look closely. Um, they're not like captioned or anything, and they were used obviously without any permission. Um, but there's a kind of a like raw energy, the print quality, um, like this kind of weird border, I mean, it's a bad trim on the edge, but also um, it's almost like they didn't really have full, like the text is not always straight with relation to the images, and then like you get these weird kind of, you know, this moment right here, which is kind of a no-no, but I think that they did, it, it suggests that they didn't have total control over the means of production. They were still kind of learning them. Um, but in his other uh, publications, you see, Perlman was experimenting with overlapping color plates, um, just creating weird designs. 
So a lot of these texts are pretty dry texts, but you would kind of juxtapose them with things that you just, you know, like cool images. Um, in this book, which he co-authored, he, 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 he touched on the entire section with these elaborate drop caps at the start of each paragraph. And these are comprised of a black letter type overlaid on the portrait of a revolutionary world leader. Mm -hmm. And this process would have been like enormously time consuming, but it also really is, um, it's really, uh, it's a big design move that if you, you know, you can only do that when you yourself authored the text to make that decision, because A, it's a lot of labor, but B, it, it changes the way we read the text. So um, he also got really into making these collages, uh, and he would use images that he found important to embed like secret political messages within the texts. Um, so Lorraine Perlman has written of these early days at the printing co-op that, quote, Freddie was exhilarated by all aspects of the new activity. He frequently asserted that never before had he felt so intellectually stimulated as he was by the challenges and gratifications he found in mastering the graphic arts equipment and techniques. Uh, so, and, and, and so here's this type on a curve, which is also a little bit uh, difficult to do, but and you can see. You know, so, and I should say a lot of these images are coming from like three or four publications that were printed all in the same span, like two years or so. And his later publications are not as exciting. I think he, I think he got bored a little bit. I mean, I think he was really into it for a while, and then got a little tired of it. But. Uh, in his, but, I, but so I feel like Perlman, in his resistance to obeying one prescribed vocation, like being an academic or being an author, being a printer, he was also like a cellist. Uh, he he embodied a kind of politicized craftsperson whose output was wholly original and unexpected. Um, on the on the page that's usually reserved for copyright information, Perlman would or whoever was publishing would, would would often highlight the precise labor that went into production of a publication, or in this case, he sort of making note that the work was not made by wage labor, wage workers, and is not made to produce a commodity. Um, so just in closing, um, like at an, at an earlier historical moment when the role of the typesetter, printer, author, and publisher overlapped, um, you would get maybe more of this kind of interplay. But even as those, so as those um, roles kind of became separated, it was like the printer is somebody who works with machines and the author is someone who works with ideas and these two things don't interact. Um, but the philosopher um, Regis de Grey has described the printer as, quote, quintessentially a worker intellectual or an intellectual worker, the very ideal of that human type who would become the pivot of socialism, the conscious proletarian. Um, so although, although Freddie Perlman was primarily concerned with ideas, you know, he didn't think of himself as a designer or a typographer. He, he designed books that were more complicated and more interesting to look at than was strictly necessary. And I'd argue that some of this experimental energy stems from this overlap, uh, but also from the structure of the co-op, this decision not to work for money, um, or to kind of purposefully try to not work for money. And then also, uh, it's just the kind of thing that's not really rational uh, in a system that's kind of defined by the rules of capitalism, where you have someone who's a printer, someone who's a typesetter, and that's a more efficient way to go. So, um, yeah, so that's all I have to say. I'm going to give the first person who's to speak who's wearing 3D glasses. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll call on you anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm really interested about the, inter about the role of ideology here, and especially the overlap. I mean, IWW makes sense. It's overlap between anarchism and socialism in the broadest sense, and basically how he understood that. Uh, I mean, especially the IWW. I mean, is this embracing the IWW, um, and as well, especially with kind of really interesting use of revolutionary figures, uh, most of them, most of the Marxists. So, I mean, yeah, I'm also interested in that because it's a, I, I need to read more of his texts because uh, I've spent a lot of time with Lorraine Coleman, his wife. Uh, 
but he specifically resisted any kind of labeling. And in fact, there's a book that they published like later in the 70s that came out of the print call that was against unions. Um, and I think they stopped using the bug, or there was debate about whether they should use the bug after that point because they started to resist, you know, the, you know especially in Detroit, there was a lot of um, uh, opposition to like the, um, you know, racist union practices uh, going on here. So I think that they, um, they, 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 but, they, but still, they were in the IWW. They one of the big, their big like job print job was actually print the little red songbook. Uh, yeah. That was that, that was like a com kind of a commercial job for them. But I, I, the only thing I can say with that revolutionary leaders thing, that's this weird book that's actually uh, it's called Manual for Revolutionary Leaders, and it's written, it's published, by, it's written by a pseudonym. Do you know it? Like yeah, Michael yeah. Belli. So it's actually it's supposed to be like Machiavelli, but it's actually Freddie and Lorraine Perlman just assembled all these quotes from other leaders. So it's a total, it's a diss of the idea that there can be such a thing as a revolutionary leader. So all those images, they're not captioned. Um, so I don't recognize a lot of them, but I think the idea is that it's, it, they go they go back, they start with the most current people and they go back through time. And I think the idea is that they're all like revolutionary despots kind of. Um, but I, but I, so, so whenever I talk to Lorraine, you know, like she would never say he's an anarchist. He didn't like Marxists or communists and, or poor socialists or anything like that. They, they, so it's hard to describe it. You know. Can I have a follow up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just really quickly. So I, I'm just wondering, if I, so if they're calling their, their press red and black, right? So that's yeah. anarcho syndicalist. And the IWW was it's headquartered in Chicago. So I wonder if this idea from solidarity is kind of this yeah. movement that way. Uh, right. I, mean, I don't. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know. They were very. They were very fluid. <laughs> well, the fluidity is what you demonstrate by the the visual and the text. Is yeah. that they, uh, the ways in which they they blend together. Uh, the answer about the choice of typographical union is that the union goes back to uh, mid 19th century. Yeah, like the newspapers. So. Yeah, they were so. But still, I think it's interesting. Retain that language. But it's still kind of interesting to me that they chose, that they identified, you know, that it was the typographers that made that, you know, that's typographical union versus a printer's union. I mean, it's just interesting to me today when I first, you know, because as a, I think of type design or typography not as like a worker's activity as much as printing, you know. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but, but, no, still, but you know what I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sense, absolutely. Um, uh, not only that, but your whole talk made sense. Does anyone have any <laughs> additional questions uh, for uh, for Danielle? Uh, and I, I want to thank you very much for a, an exciting presentation and uh, thank all of you for joining us for the three terrific talks by Robert, Mary and Richard and Danielle and you get a five minute break. Um, it's actually a little bit longer but I don't want you to take advantage of it because We've got to be on time. Um, more seriously, there is uh, water and, uh, and coffee, and we re will reassemble uh, in a few minutes at, uh, at 2 o'clock.